The following program contains graphic images some viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. In 2006, a mysterious fungus appeared in a cave in upstate New York, and soon after that, the hibernating bats began to die. Within just a few years, that fungus spread over 2,000 miles throughout the Northeast, in many colonies, wiping out more than 90% of the bats it came into contact with. This is probably the most devastating wildlife disease to ever hit North America. Because the fungus first grows around the bat's nose, scientists called it white nose syndrome. Now, more than six million bats are dead. Bats are incredibly resilient and are highly adapted to their environment and to changing conditions, and, and they've evolved to be able to handle anything. And here comes this disease that just is completely wiping them out, and it's blown all of us away. Pennsylvania has emerged as a major player in the national fight against white nose syndrome, even as our own bats continue to die. Some experts fear it may be too late to help them. A lot of people don't understand bats very well, might have a fear of bats, and really don't understand why should I care that all of the bats in my backyard are gone. In agriculture, in forestry, and even in terms of human health, bats perform a crucial service pest control worth billions of dollars, but white nose syndrome is threatening to push entire bat species to the brink of extinction. Bats are uh, amazing creatures. They're dying in unprecedented numbers. This is a, a huge wildlife disaster. I think Pennsylvania will have very few bats left. Not so long ago, this is what the night sky looked like over Canoe Creek State Park. This is what the sky looks like now since White Nose Syndrome arrived in Pennsylvania in late December 2008. With White Nose, you know, it, it's something we never saw coming. Fungus that just not only works on their body, but also affects their behavioral mechanisms for survival. We're seeing 95 to 99, in some places 100% declines of common species. Cal Butchkoski is a wildlife biologist with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. The left wing looks very clean. He and a team of technicians are counting and tagging bats at an old mine shaft on park property. The trouble is, there aren't many bats left to count. What we do know is that the bats were pouring out of here to die for the last two winters. Our last count was before white nose syndrome came through and was about 35,000 bats in this site alone. My hope is that we'll have two to 3,000 bats survive here. Greg Turner is another biologist with the Game Commission and he's an endangered mammal specialist. Tonight's survey could provide signs of hope or paint a grim picture of just how few bats remain. This harmless device, called a harp trap, catches the bats. The technicians weigh, measure, and ban the bats, and then release them. And the number on this band is PAGC 55197. In past years, a survey like this could yield thousands of bats over the course of a night. Greg's hopes this year are modest. Hopefully we'll catch a, at least a couple hundred bats tonight. Bats make up more than one-fifth of all mammals on the planet. Most eat insects exclusively, and six of those species are native to Pennsylvania. The state's network of caves and mines provide perfect underground shelters in winter. They're called hibernacula. Bats spend the summer gorging on insects and building up fat reserves to make it through hibernation. Then they head deep into the hibernacula, drop their body temperatures to conserve energy, and ride out the winter until their food source returns. It's an extraordinary survival strategy. And then white nose syndrome arrived, trumping 50 million years of highly specialized evolution. Is this fungus has become a part of this underground ecosystem. Even though it's an exotic species, it has come in and established itself, and it's here every year. 
which means even bats lucky enough to survive it one winter will have to return to that hibernacula the following fall and fight it again. When they go into these sites, they cluster up. And then when the fungus grows, it produces all these spores. And the bat arouses and flies around. And as it flies around, it's spreading the spores all over the site. The fungus does not harm humans. Our bodies are too warm to make good hosts. This fungus is what's called psychrophilic, meaning it's cold loving. It grows best between 39 and 51 degrees, the very same temperature range that holds steady deep inside caves and mines where bats prefer to hibernate. And when they hibernate and drop their body temperatures, bats also suppress their immune systems, creating the right conditions for the fungus to grow on the bats. This is basically like a perfect storm uh, hitting these bats. The fungus's formal name is Geomyces destructans. This bat died completely covered in it. The white growth first shows up around the bat's muzzle. Then it spreads to invade connective tissues and muscles, causing thousands of tiny wounds. And as the fungus starts growing on them and getting into their follicles and in and under their skin, it's a, we think it's an irritant. And it starts waking them up. And every time a bat wakes up, it uses 30, 40, 50 days worth of fat reserve. Healthy bats normally do rouse from hibernation every few weeks, but the ones with white nose syndrome seem to be rousing every few days, depleting their fat reserves. Some die still clinging to the wall, others fall to the floor. The white fuzz you see here is actually fungus covering a carpet of bat bones and decaying carcasses. Sick bats may also move to the front of the hibernacula, leaving rows of dead at the mouths of caves. And many bats fly outside in search of food that isn't there. Here at Canoe Creek in February, you know, we had ice fishermen out on the lake. We had geese in some of the pockets of open water. And we had bats flying around them. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Starving and dehydrated, the bats eat the snow. These bats are so severely impaired because the fungus also destroys their nerves. This is a common sight in white-nosed ravaged areas, a ring of dead bats at the base of a tree, signs the bats tried to roost here before dying and dropping to the ground. We have six species of hibernating bats. The northern long-eared is getting hit the hardest. They have about a 98% decline. Uh, the little brown and pipistrelle are right behind them, with declines in Pennsylvania ranging from 90 to 95%. Little brown bats are the most common bat species in North America. Now they're being considered for the endangered species list. This is a female, and she is a little fussy. Mm -hmm. The big brown bat is faring a bit better. Its population is down by only 50%. Pennsylvania also has a species called small-footed bats, but they're hard to monitor because of obscure habits. Good job, you got yourself you pulled out an Indiana bat. The last of the state's six species is the Indiana bat. It's been on the federally endangered species list since 1967, and it's the only federally endangered mammal in Pennsylvania. He's got a more of a more of a Roman nose type of appearance. It's much more furred on the forehead. It's a nice roundish uh, uh, profile from the forehead down to the nose. Since white nose syndrome struck, Pennsylvania's Indiana bat population is down by more than 70 percent. The state is required to conduct a regular census of the Indiana bat, but for years, meticulous biologists counted other species too, crucial data that help them gauge mortality once the fungus struck. Forearm is 32. The state also had advanced warning that white nose was on its way, so it could devise a plan to track and study it all reasons why Pennsylvania emerged as a leader in this national battle. We mobilized really quickly and, 
and found a lot of really willing uh, collaborators and and we all got together and worked together and you know we're not in this for our egos we're in this to try and learn something and help out the bats. A lot of people don't understand the importance of bats and they don't know what they do for us. Our farmers really get a big benefit from bats. A really big benefit in the form of free pest control. Bats are the only nighttime insect eaters we have, feasting on crop-eating moths and beetles and massive amounts of mosquitoes. A single bat can eat up to 1,000 mosquitoes in an hour. A million bats could consume nearly 700 million tons of mosquitoes in one year. According to a study done through the U.S. Geologic Survey, that free pest control saves farmers about $74 per acre. Agriculture is Pennsylvania's number one industry. And bats pest control saves the state $300 million each year. Nationally, it adds up to a staggering $23 billion savings. So if the insect population actually does change because of the severe bat decline, uh, we could be seeing increased uses of pesticides, but we can also be seeing increased uh, prices in our food. It's going to cost a lot more to feed the cattle and the chickens and everything else. And, and so the price of eggs and milk and meat, it's all going to increase. Meaning this wildlife crisis carries heavy consequences for humans as well as bats. We'll come back to Canoe Creek later to find out just how many bats they trapped in the course of the night. But first, where did the Geomyces destructans fungus come from? Scientists believe it found its way here from Europe, but most European bats managed to survive the fungus, suggesting they evolved with it and built up resistance over millions of years, resistance our bats don't have. The environmental conditions are right for the fungus to grow in caves, basically from northern Florida all the way up into Canada. By the end of 2011, Geomyces destructans was found in 16 U.S. states and four Canadian provinces. Based on how white-nose syndrome has been spreading since we first discovered it, we have reason to believe that it will continue spreading south and west. So this is a pretty epic wildlife disease crisis. U.S. Fish and Wildlife is the federal agency leading the National Response Plan and funding much of the research. Since 2008, it's offered $9 million in grants. And in the final days of 2011, Congress announced it's allocating another $4 million from the Department of the Interior's Endangered Species Recovery Fund. During the winter, when we are getting a lot of reports of new sites, I get a little disheartened about what the future holds for bats. I'm most optimistic uh, about white-nose syndrome and our efforts to contain and manage the disease when I'm working with our partners. Uh, we've got a really amazing and uh, very dedicated group of partners. The Pennsylvania Game Commission has been involved in the white nose response since basically uh, the discovery of white nose syndrome. They've worked very closely with Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the state agency has provided a lot of support for the white nose response. Um, also, Bucknell University, Deanne Reeder um, and her lab have really been one of the leaders in some of the white nose uh, research that's been going on. And the cooperative response is, is really sort of unprecedented in dealing with a disease of this nature. So this is all set up, this is our hundred. Yeah. So, she's Deanne Reeder and Bucknell University, names that come up again and again in the White Nose Syndrome saga. Right. Well before White Nose Syndrome struck, she and her team of biologists, lab techs, and graduate students were studying bat hibernation habits and their immune systems. So the lab was already set up to study hibernating bats under controlled conditions. So it put us in the position to be able to actually just start this work really rapidly. I don't think I've worked this hard in my life since I was getting my PhD. The main question they're asking here is why some bat species seem to be able to resist the fungus better than others. We're working really hard to try to understand that because there are 25 species in the U.S. that could potentially get white nose syndrome as it continues to move west. And so if we can predict which of those species are likely to get white nose syndrome, we can have very targeted conservation efforts. I don't think that we will ever cure white nose syndrome. There's no precedence for ever being able to cure a wildlife disease of this scope. But what we can do is try to mitigate it. And I think that the most successful mitigation strategies will be those that come at it from multiple different 
angles. We have some drug treatment trials where we're testing several different antifungal drugs to see whether or not it will give these bats any sort of um, advantage. The issue with antifungal treatments is you don't know what, how those drugs might be metabolized in a hibernating animal. And you can't simply spray a cave with a fungicide because that could also kill the good organisms that are vital to the ecosystem. These are climate controlled chambers and they're filled with hibernating bats. But Deanne also needed a way to track bats' body temperatures in a natural environment. And commercial data loggers were too heavy. So Deanne and Greg Turner of the Pennsylvania Game Commission redesigned the device. We saw them open, there's a little circuit board inside. We trimmed down that circuit board, super glue it back to the, uh, to the battery there. They calibrate and program the data logger to read a bat's body temperature every 30 minutes. Then they dip it in plastic to waterproof it and attach it to the bat's back with a medical grade skin adhesive. When they retrieve the device, it provides about 8,000 data points. It's all part of a massive effort to battle one very minute fungus. These tubes contain reproductive spores of Geomyces destructans. It just seems like this harmless little thing sitting in my refrigerator. But this is enough to kill, you know, I don't know, maybe a thousand bats. And it's, it's a, this is the bane of our existence right now. Um, I love that, um, that the group who worked on the fungus named it Destructans. They named it for what it's doing to the bats. What are you doing up there? Hmm? This is the lab's flight cage. Strange. The bats being studied they live cold. here when they're not hibernating. I know. Are you trying to get that mealworm that's just crawled through? They train the bats here to self-feed on enriched mealworms and go through about 10,000 a week. Bats may be big eaters, but they're slow to reproduce. They have one pup a year. That pup has a 50% survival chance its first year. And that's bleak news in terms of the population bouncing back. U.S. Fish and Wildlife said it would take 200 years before bat populations could rebound to what they were before the crisis began. And that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is that these numbers are going to be so low for bats, they'll have a hard time finding mates. And, and the numbers will eventually crash. The good thing, I mean, when you try to look for little rays of hope in this work, now that there's a, so few bats, there's lots of food. And so if you're no longer competing with 95% of the bats that you used to compete with, you ought to be able to easily find food without expending as much energy. Another glimmer of hope, in 2011, some researchers found isolated colonies of little brown bats in the wild that seem to be surviving white-nose syndrome. Biologists will be studying those bats closely to see if they reveal clues to containing the disease, but the answers are unlikely to arrive in time to help Pennsylvania's few remaining cave bats. I think for Pennsylvania bats, the story is, is nearly finished. For the species that appear to be susceptible, the nail does appear to be in the coffin. That focus on the survivors is, I think, a really important one, and the next role that Pennsylvania can play in whiteness syndrome research. It's probably the singularly most important thing that I'll ever do in my career. Pennsylvania residents can play an important role in the fight against white nose syndrome by helping to protect the bats that survive. It starts with education, and to clear up some of the most common myths that give bats such a bad rap, we turn to Carnegie Museum mammal specialist Suzanne McLaren. You know, bats get a lot of bad PR, and uh, even though uh, Twilight has sort of made vampirism a more uh, sexy kind of thing in recent years. We definitely have Hollywood to thank for the most enduring myth. I am Dracula. The bats are out to suck your blood. You might be surprised to know that the small one here is actually the vampire. Hollywood likes to use uh, bats of this size, which is really just a harmless fruit-eating bat. This guy's kind of puny by comparison. Only three species of bats actually eat blood, and they're native to South and Central America. And they prefer cattle and birds to human necks. Another common misconception, that bats are dirty animals. Bats are very fastidious when they're awake. They, they groom themselves like cats. They, they lick their fur and they, they really take care of their bodies. Many people fear contracting the rabies virus from bats, and bats do carry it. If you don't handle bats, or any other wildlife for that matter, spread to humans has a very low incident rate. Finally, bats are not blind, and they won't fly into your hair.
It's illogical. That echolocation capability that they have, it helps them find food, but it also helps them um, you know, protect their bodies, especially their wings. In light of white nose syndrome, Suzanne says we really can't afford to indulge our bat phobias any longer. There is, you know, sort of a cliche, but there's a web of life. They have impacts that we may not even realize until they're gone. As part of its conservation efforts, the Pennsylvania Game Commission issued mandatory cave and mine closings. But many are on private lands, where regulations don't apply. Much as you might love to explore, stay out of bat hibernacula in the winter. And after outdoor activities, use a bleach solution to kill spores that stick to gear so you don't spread white nose from cave to cave, or even worse, help it make a big jump across the continent. You can aid the Game Commission as it tracks the spread of white nose syndrome by reporting any bats you see outside during the winter. And if a bat takes up residence in your attic during the summer, don't kill it. It is illegal to kill a bat in Pennsylvania. Contact professionals who will relocate the bat using a harmless process called exclusion. Or give the bats an alternative to your attic by providing a bat box. This is a group of freshmen from Point Park University, and they're building bat boxes as part of a community service project. A local home repair store helped the students plan and prepare for the construction. We're part of the community, we're here to serve. Just watching them and then knowing that this is going to be something that's going to go out and help the bat population was what made it all worthwhile. The students are using approved bat box plans found on the Game Commission's website. Bat boxes provide safe summer roosts for bats, particularly when females give birth in May and June. Boxes like these can keep pups safe from predators such as owls and raccoons. A few weeks later, the bat boxes are in the hands of the Pennsylvania chapter of the Nature Conservancy an international nonprofit that protects habitats. Historically, bats would have roosted behind the loose bark of large old trees, and during the last part of the 1800s and the early 1900s, most of those trees were removed from the forest. So we're trying to provide additional habitat, additional roosting habitat for bats at a time when their populations really are in big trouble. We've chosen this particular location because of the habitat. We've got a cave close by, we've got some open water in the form of a pond, we've got forested areas, we've got open fields, and so we've got a very diverse habitat in order for the bats to be able to feed. Locating it in an area where it's facing the, either the east or the south, so it gets that solar heating, and uh, 10 to 15 feet in the air. One of the things that people can do to help bats is to support conservation organizations such as the Nature Conservancy and other organizations that are working to protect, protect habitat and and bats in uh, Pennsylvania and beyond. Back at Canoe Creek State Park, Game Commission biologists Greg Turner and Cal Butchkoski show how to provide artificial roosts on a much larger scale. This is an old garage the park purchased and converted as part of its bat management program. And we put these baffles in. Now these ba baffles, we learned that they like crevices between three quarters and one inch to squeeze into. And we gave them some vertical dimension so they can move down to get closer to ambient temperature. The park manages another artificial roost, this converted church, and it was a popular summer tourist attraction. You would have five, eight, ten thousand bats just in this whole area right behind the building just flying around in a circle all together. And uh, it's kind of like a social hour, yeah. I, I figure, I guess, you know, make sure everybody came home for the night and nobody was lost out there. But uh, yeah, and then all of a sudden they would just, you know, okay, it's time to go in and shoot right in that hole. And it was really something to see. The signs are still here. It's the bats that are missing. This past summer, the site was down to just 200 of them. Yeah. And that brings us back to the biologists trapping and counting bats later that night in the abandoned mine. Wanna do another release? Just how many bats did they trap? To understand the number better, compare it to what they'd get before white nose syndrome hit. Back then, traps were so full they needed to be emptied every half hour, adding up to thousands of bats over the course of a night. Look at all of them. How many do you think are in here? This is amazing. 
On this night, after spending six hours at a site that once served as hibernacula for more than 35,000 bats, the team trapped just 38 bats. Greg Turner said by the end of 2011, hibernacula surveys performed to date show white-nose syndrome has already killed 98% of Pennsylvania's cave bats. You know, we've spent years and years protecting and monitoring them and watching these populations do really well and watch them grow. And then within a year or two, watching them go down 100%, 95% in a year or two. That's your personal hard work and your research and everything that's just bitten the dust. And yeah, it's, it's hard not to take that personal. We are in it for the long haul and we just gotta keep looking at the positive side and saying that, you know, there are gonna be survivors. You know, some people say, you know, there's nothing you can do about this and you, you know, it's, it's a battle that we're gonna lose. Well, I'm not one to give up. It's just a really hard thing to see these animals that you love just truly suffering in this way. To do this work with white nose, I think to sort of have to try to put all of that aside. You know, the only thing I know how to do is to put my nose to the grindstone and keep doing the work. Every bat that we find is precious and needs to be conserved.